Welcome home. You're listening to the Princeton Real Estate Podcast, and I'm your host, Laura Huntsman. In this episode, we're going to dive right into a topic that I think is probably on the minds of many home sellers right now, and that's the task of preparing your house for sale. My guest today is someone whose residential design work I have admired for many, many years. I'm lucky to have Katie Eastridge on the program of Eastridge Design, and Katie is a residential interior designer with a national reputation in the design industry. And they've termed her style of design understated splendor. And I I love that description of your work, Katie. I really do. Thank you, Laura. We, We aim to keep things simple and beautiful. In the background today, you may hear a bit of hammering, as Princeton is always improving, and I'm broadcasting today from my studio on the corner of Harrison and Nassau. Now, Katie has been in this business since 1991, and she works up and down the eastern seaboard and even works on the west coast when needed, but her favorite spot to work in is her hometown of Princeton and that's where her design studio is located. Katie, we're going to talk about something that I think anyone who's considering selling their home right now is wrestling with, and that is the somewhat daunting task of preparing your house for sale. It can seem like an enormous undertaking. So we're going to try and and break that down into steps, demystify it for our listeners. And you have a wonderful sense of how to do that as as we've discussed before. So let's just let's just talk about if if you were approaching someone who was getting ready to sell their house and sweating bullets over what to do, what would be on the top of your list to tell them in terms of how do you start? How do you even get off the dime on this? I think that I would begin by trying to create a visualization of why you are selling your house and what you are looking forward to. Because if you can replace the, the sort of minor frustrations of what you will be facing in the months ahead with the big goal and never forgetting the big goal, everything falls into place. So you may already have another home that you're planning to move to. You may know where you're planning to move. Sometimes that makes it a little easier because it helps you figure out what you need to take with you and what you could leave behind. So getting a big sort of like breath in your lungs and get excited about it. It's a new beginning for you. That's so true. It's just a new beginning. And your agent, your decorator, your professionals are all there to help you and guide you through the way. You're not alone. No, that is true. You are not alone. And your first step should be to start to assemble your team. If you have an agent or are in the process of selecting an agent, you want an agent who brings their own team to the table. And for example, when I list a house, I have my photographer, I have my videographer, who is also a licensed drone pilot. I have my floor plan drafters, my copywriters. So there's a team right there to help start. And a good agent will also help you stage what we call staging, but it it doesn't have to be a, a massive undertaking. Uh, in, in turn, you and I are list makers, Katie. When we make lists of what to do when starting to go through a home. And I know most listeners have heard, oh, yes, you need to clean, you need to tidy up your house, you need to remove family pictures. They've read all that before. So we want to bring 
some things to the table that they may not be as familiar with. Let's start with that, the word purge or the word remove. I can speak to that, Laura. I think that there are three categories of possessions. Things that you know that you want to keep things that you know you are going to discard, give away, remove, and things you just plain don't know about. So I would call the categories yeses, nos, and maybes. There are a million different ways to approach this. If you're a written list maker, you can make a list of yeses, nos, and maybes. If you like a little more action, you can set aside a corner in your house for the maybes. The maybes are the toughest, but the most important part of a maybe is not to get stuck on it. You're just placing it there because you don't know, and you'll return to it another time. Sometimes just getting started reduces the inertia. That's true. That's true. But you, you can get bogged down on those maybes, those sentimental things, or you open the lid on a rubber tub of photographs and spend hours going through the photographs. So when you're readying a house for sale, time is of the essence, and you really need to cut to the chase. So if you need to cut to the chase, go for the yeses. You know what you want to keep. You just know if you like your bed or you don't, if you like your sofa or you don't. Plan on keeping those in your life. I'm not saying that they need to stay in the house for the sale, but just knowing what you want to keep. Push those maybes aside and give yourself the time later to go through them. You could even box things up and push them to a corner of the garage, a corner of the room. Set them aside for later. It's hard to look at things that have sentimental value. They touch your heart and you can sort of get lost in it for a moment. The idea is to stay focused. If it helps you, you can break it down by time of day where Whatever time of day works for you, you assign yourself two hours and you walk around with a, a trash bag and you throw out anything that you possibly can. That's another, that's one way. You could assign yourself a closet a day, a closet a week, a room a day, and just, just keep going through it. It's like sifting sand. Little by little, the piles get smaller and smaller. It's going to happen. I think that the separation that needs to be made is what your house should look like when it's ready to be marketed and what you need to keep and not keep. They're two very different topics. So I just wanted to say that I think your agent, your decorator, your professional will very much be able to help you focus on what it should look like when it goes on the market. And let's talk about that because that is really important. It's important for people who are selling to look at the other listings that are online, look at the condition, look at how they sparkle or don't sparkle based on the photographs you can see online and to compare their own houses to their competition and to try the goal is you, you can't totally change and totally renovate your home that's not the goal the goal is to make your house the best it can be do you have any tips for that well i Katie? think that yes i do i i think that you're absolutely right we live in an era where photography is king. And we, you, together, need to make your house look photogenic. That's really the most important thing because your house is going to be marketed and eventually sold 
by the enticing photographs that oh, yes. you're going to have. And those photographs are just like the difference between a snapshot that is taken of your face and a professional photograph. A huge difference. That snapshot may not make you happy, but a professional photograph will look beautiful. And you just have to help that along. So, even starting out by guessing where the cameras are going to be and looking in that direction can start to help. Typically, cameras are placed in corners and then the lens is wide and spreads the information. So, if those corners are all filled up with stuff, if you have things on your windowsills, heavy curtains covering up those windows, chances are they're not going to be there in the photograph. So you need to start thinking about that. Just opening up the space, the point is, is we're trying to neutralize that house so that another person can come in and begin to feel as though the house could be theirs, that they could leave their stamp on it that it could be imprinted. Laura, I know you deal with this day in and day out. I well, do. And you, you do. do too for people who are creating their dream homes. I'm fortunate that I typically get the phone call right after the house is sold. Nevertheless, if someone does have their eye on another home, sometimes we create a furniture plan based on where they're going, and it helps them start to visualize and also break that attachment. The point is to become attached to your new home and feel detached from the home that you're selling. That's true. In, in essence, it, it stops becoming your home and it becomes a house, a house that is for sale. And granted, it's, it's very hard to live in a house when the house is being shown and trying to keep all your surfaces clean and all those things that we know need to happen. But it is now a house. It, it's a commodity being marketed, and it needs to always look its best. And there are very specific ways to do that. Uh, I always start at the front because the first thing that's going to happen when your house is put on the market is you're going to get a number of people driving by. If your house does not look great on that drive-by when they're looking at it from the road, hence the title curb appeal, they're not going to necessarily want to go inside. And if there's peeling paint, if the yard is unkempt, if, if, if things look like they're falling apart, that can rule, at, rule you off of their let's go visit this list. So starting outside is important. And then walking up the your walkway to the front door, that front door area is important because that's where buyers stand with their realtor. They look around while the realtor is taking that key and opening that door, and they start to make decisions about, is this house in good shape or not? Very interesting. Very interesting. So it sounds like to me, Laura, what you're suggesting is that there may be some um, light renovation or repairs that need to be made prior to getting the house on the market. Yes. Is that, is that true? That is true. And they can be simple ones. They can be accomplished by a wonderful handyman who can replace rotten wood or a painter who can give the house a once-over extra coat or a power washing by a, a, a landscaper or the person who does your lawn to come and just trim things up and have them looking good. So it doesn't have to be a huge landscape redo. They can be very simple things, but the first thing that's going to happen is that drive-by. The next thing that's going to happen is that walk up to the front door. And then the next phase is buyers and their realtor open that door. And what do they see when they first walk in? And not only what do they see, but what do they smell? 
And you and I have very strong opinions about what a house should smell like, don't we, Katie? Well, I feel very strongly that all houses should smell like the terrace doors on the coast of Maine just opened on your summer rental. Just as clean and fresh and cold and beautiful is that. There should be no discernible fragrance of anything, a meal, anything at all. Nothing, I think the days of cookies baking in the oven have gone by the wayside. Yes, what those what are would gone. you say, Laura? Yep, those are gone. What do you do with your pets and the pet smells? What is necessary? It's imperative that you're obviously not going to get rid of your pets. They're your family. But you do need to do, before you open the doors to showings, you do need to do a deep clean. If there are pet stains on the carpets, those need to be cleaned. Or if it's really bad, the carpets need to be replaced. And the pet area where they tend to congregate needs to just be kept super hairless, super clean, no hairballs from your cats, and no no pet food all over the floor, because there are buyers who are allergic to pets. There are buyers who are fearful of pets. And when you're showing your house, your pets really should leave the house with you. Sometimes with cats, that's not possible. But you really want your house as pet-free seeming as possible. And you don't want to smell those pets when you first walk in the door. You don't want to smell a litter box. You don't want to smell wet dog. So having that fresh smell, Katie, that you just described, feeling like you're in Maine flinging open those doors, is is exactly what you want a house to smell like. You want it to just smell fresh and clean. No heavy odors of the garlic spaghetti you cooked last night. No potpourri burning. No scented candles because people can be allergic to those. Just fresh and clean. That's what a house should smell like. Well, I think that embedded in what I hear you saying is neutral. Yep. That, That when you go with your agent to view a house you are not going to get excited about, you don't want the, the new buyer to get excited about your furniture, your artwork, the quilt you have on your bed. You want the new buyer to get excited about the house and anything in the house that is too specific, anything that could offend someone it's not really part of the story that you want to present. That's very true. And there, as well as talking about what to pick and choose, having minimal artwork, very specific artwork, having fewer photographs, having less to distract the buyer from the house itself, and also just having more of that stuff becomes a little overwhelming and it 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 adds to the angst of the buyer who says i already live this way i don't want to move into a house and live this way again they want to live in a minimalistic way in a clean and open way they want light and the more stuff you have that clogs their vision as they walk in the house, the less likely they are to select that house as a house to purchase. So from a logistics point of view, it's important to note that you don't have to keep it in the house when it's being prepared for sale. It's a very simple trick of just having storage off-site you for bet, the short a storage run, unit. Yep. A storage unit. And even if you're pressed for time, some of those maybes could go in there too. What I like to help people understand is there is a kind of decision tree or a path to getting to the right place, and it can be done very quickly. 
You just have to listen to your professionals, listen to some guidance, and go with it. Probably what's left in the house when it comes time to show it should be, I don't want to use a percentage, but I'm going to say 50% of what you own. I agree. 20% of what you own isn't bad either. It yep, less, just, less is definitely more. This is the Mies van der Rohe theme. Less is more. Less is more. Less and, is more. And my, my maxim with a number of my clients is when in doubt, get it out. <laughs> get it out. It can, it, if you're pressed for time, just get it out of the house, put it in a storage unit. Yes. Sometimes if you have an enormous empty basement, you can put some things down there as long as they are organized. I, I always find that clients have way too many chairs. Chairs just seem to multiply like rabbits. <laughs> and if we can minimize the number of excess chair supply of a house and either put that in a basement or put it in a storage unit, it's amazing how much it opens up the space. The furnishings are in most homes. Every house is different and has personality. Look better where they're not pushed up against walls. True. The furniture in the centers of the room so the new buyer can see all around is a good goal. For your own sake, getting back to this purging or deacquisition, something to ask yourself is how many more times in my life do I want to look at this? You're looking at it and you're thinking that it's going to be a yes, no, or maybe. And if you feel like, oh, I, you know, it had value, I paid this for it, it came from an ID. Nevertheless, you have to just ask yourself, do I really want to own this for the rest of my life? And don't trick yourself into thinking that your children want it. They want to do their own. <laughs> no, they don't want it. They don't want it. They really don't. I mean, of course there is. Um, an exception to that rule. But most people, just like you, want to start afresh. That's, that's, so, that's so true. Just and, want to start afresh. Yep. In, when we're talking about removing things, furniture should, excess furniture should be removed, excess photos Bookcases should be organized and looking somewhat minimalistic. Removing plants, there are oftentimes way too many plants that we bring in, particularly in the winter. And you don't want anything blocking windows, blocking doors, blocking entryways. The, uh, I was in theater long before I was in real estate. And so when I enter a house, it's always viewed to me as a theatrical set. And so the word staging means something very literal to me. But you don't want buyers to have to maneuver their way through some sort of maze to get through your rooms. You want your rooms to be open and simple and clean and smell great and those windows are key because the windows are, you know, pe people say the, the uh, my, my dad used to tell me, you can wash and wax a car, but if you don't clean the wheels, the, house, the car looks still dirty. And I think windows are the same way in a house. If you do not clean your windows, the house does not look clean because those windows are the eye of the house. It, it, it gives you the views outside. It lets the sun from the outside in. And that includes outside pruning. If you have a bush that's growing up on the outside of a window and is blocking the window view, that bush needs to be trimmed back or it needs to go. So I, I'm a big window person, as you can tell. Well, I think that they should sparkle. They should. They should sparkle. Well, let's go back to something that I know is on people's minds. 
what to do about dated kitchens and bathrooms. Mm -hmm. What would you suggest, Laura? Well, it everything is a case by case basis because every house is different. So it really depends on if you're looking at a kitchen where the cabinets could be repainted, the countertop could be replaced, and the backsplash could be replaced. That's a fairly simple project. If you're looking at a kitchen that is dated in such a way as the layout is bad and could use a complete redo, I don't typically recommend people undertake a complete kitchen redo just for the sale of their home. If they're going to live in their home for a few years and get to enjoy that kitchen, that's a different story. But to do it to resell, they're not going to recoup their money. And kitchens are so idiosyncratic to the potential buyer that I would just leave it be and know that you're going to have to discount your price so that the next buyer can redo the kitchen. One of the, I think you're absolutely right, one of the um, changes that I have seen happening over housing in the past five years is that whatever the hopeful or market price of the house is, should there be an odious kitchen or a bathroom, that buyer today is savvy enough to know that that will cost a certain amount of money. And so therefore, they are going to factor in that expense into what they wish to pay for the home. So one way or another, you are going to end up paying for this, either in the price that you get for sale or in making the changes to make the house more marketable. That's a big change from other years. Some people move often, but not everyone does. And I always find it's a bit of a surprise to learn what the current situation might be. That's, that's totally correct. The current situation now is condition is key. The better the condition, the more readily a house sells, the better the gain for the seller from a price perspective, and the happier everybody is. Things, things move along very quickly. But if a house needs a great deal of work, it's not just money that buyers are taking into consideration, it's also their time and the disruption to their lives. So most buyers would prefer just to move in and unpack, have everything done, have everything done neutrally, because you can have a brand new kitchen in a house, but if it's done in a crazy color to the buyers, it's going to need to be redone. So your point, Katie, earlier of neutralizing a house, if, if inevitably most houses need a room or two repainted, sometimes the whole interior repainted, if it's had a lot of wear and tear from kids or pets, and, and that's an easy, cheap fix, getting a house refreshed by paint. But dealing with renovating kitchens and baths, those are bigger projects. And it, it's, it's typically not worth gutting and doing a complete renovation just to sell your home. Well, I think that will probably come as a huge relief to everyone listening. Not that it would be necess it is not necessary. One of the things that I have found very interesting with the proliferation of photographs, the era in which we live, is that taste has really moved toward the center. The same kinds of themes and feelings are what everyone wants today. So personalization is less of a desire than it has been in other eras. People are looking for simple, clean, minimal, light, and bright. Repeatedly, I haven't had a new customer that has come to me in the past five years for something exotic, dark, and moody. 
<laughs> just isn't that, there. That's so true. Nobody wants dark. Nobody wants moody. No, everyone wants light. Everyone. Well, it's not. It's not that hard to achieve. It's. It's just not that hard to achieve. Let's back up to the beginning and talk about maybe you haven't seriously decided to sell your house. Maybe you're just kind of thinking about it and you're at the very beginning. Um, And I wanted to ask Laura what she would recommend you look for when you're looking for a real estate agent to guide you through this process? Well, that agent is going to be your at the helm of your team. That's the person you're going to be talking to. That's the person you're going to trust most of all. And you really want to connect with that person and you want to know that person has your best interests and fiduciary interests at heart and is working as hard as they can to market and to sell your house for the best price possible. You have to connect with that person though. You have to, there has to be a personal connection. If you don't like each other, that's not gonna work. If you don't trust each other, that's not going to work. And you're not just hiring the agent, you're hiring the firm that the agent works for. So you want to make sure that that firm is going to provide you with the best marketing they can. I feel lucky at Callaway Henderson Sotheby's that I have a fantastic marketing team behind me. I have the best photographers ever, and those make a big difference. And so you want to choose somebody who has that. You you don't want somebody who's going to come in and shoot photos of your house with their own camera. It's professional photographer time. It's professional videographer time. We're in a a technological time here where most people are doing their shopping online and those pictures are their first introduction to a home. That video walks them through it. And if those aren't fantastic, and I don't mean that they make the place look different than it really is. They do have to match what you're selling, but they do have to show that house at its best and and enhance the best features of that house. Every house has good features and bad features. And so you really want to be focused on what that house brings to the table. That's very interesting. So here are a couple things that I hear when people are ask me for the name of an agent or they're trying to make a decision between person A and person B. And I wanted to know how you felt about it, Laura. When someone says, well, this person works in my neighborhood often, do you see that as important? No, honestly, I don't. I, it, you just want to make sure they're very, very familiar with the area itself. They don't have to be constantly doing work in your neighborhood. They should be, you should like that person, trust that person, and want that team, and know that they know that general area. So if it's Princeton, for example, They don't have to be relegated to one area of Princeton to be able to be your best choice. So choose the person whom you trust and who has a a team with them that is going to work for you. Okay, I hear you. Here's another comparative note that I hear people say, well, I've spoken to person A, B, and C, and I'm going to go with C because she, he told me that my house would sell for the most, gave me the best price. What do you think of that? 
as a criteria for any making discussion a decision. of any discussion of price has to contain a discussion of what the data says and you have to be able to make a case for that price based on comparable sales and you also have to look at that house and say okay the other house that you're thinking about that sold for x had a brand new kitchen and new baths you do not therefore your chances of selling for x are slim unless you had that new kitchen or new bath so there has to be a discount for the lack of those things so it it really needs to be a discussion of data between your potential agent and you and a, a discussion of the different things you've put into the house recently if there have been a number of recent improvements that other houses don't have, then that takes you even higher than some of those houses in terms of potential sale price. So it, it really is a back and forth. You look at the data with your agent, but that data has to support it. It can't be just, I'm pulling this price out of my ear so that you'll give me the listing. Otherwise that listing is just gonna sit, get stale, and then the price is gonna be reduced. And it's been proven that that if it just sits and gets stale and the price gets reduced, the ultimate gain to the seller, it ends up being less. It's a very disappointing situation to find oneself in, sitting on a house that you own, that you would like to sell, and it's not selling. Particularly in this market. This, right now, the market that we're in is a hot market. There's low inventory, there's high demand, and it's a great time to sell if you know where you want to go next. It's a wonderful time to be putting your house on the market. But you do have to keep in mind that you can't just ask the moon and the stars for your house and have anybody willing to pay for it. You have to be realistic and, and follow the data. Follow the data and follow the instinct of your agent because the, the agent can take that data and say, this, this, and this sold for this. I know these houses. You have a great pool. You have a wonderful library. You have several offices. So work from home is wonderful here. And the agent can actually extrapolate that important information and help you come up with a realistic price and one that will help your house sell. Because the last thing you want is to sit on that house and have to show it over and over and over again, because showings can be tiresome to do that over and over again for a long period of time. Yes, you want to condense the amount of time that your house is in on the market it is once you've made up your mind, you've gone through all the work that it takes to prepare for sale, you are expecting to sell. And the longer your house sits on the market, the, the lower the price is going to be at sale. It, it doesn't get better. You're, in the first two weeks. Right. Your launch is key. And so if you launch your house, that's when you have the real buyers out there that's when your chance of getting competition warmed up and really buzzed about your house, that's when that all happens. And if you blow your launch by listing it too high, then you're just going to sit there and it doesn't get better from there. You know, I never understood this until um, later in my life. I had sold a house personally once at a, in a down market at a bad time of year, in real estate words. And I was serious, and I had a realistic price, and I did have a good agent, but I wasn't prepared for how quickly it would sell. And I hadn't done the work that we had discussed earlier. So it was very much a good problem, very much a good problem. My houses tend to look ready to sell just about at any time in their life, but I wasn't prepared 
And so I was asked if I could close in a very short amount of time. So good things can really happen if you are ready. But I would just suggest that you are more ready than I was that fall. Yes. Yes, you do need to be ready for if it's priced appropriately and if it's being marketed well, when it launches, offers should come in. And you have to be ready to know that those people want to capitalize on the low mortgage rates that we have now, and they're going to want to close within 45 to 60 days, sometimes sooner. And you need to know where you're going and be ready to get out. And if you really do want to sell your house, you have a million options for where to go, even if you don't own another house. Sometimes it's not bad to take a house break for a while. True. Just move and then move on when you feel more ready. And thank goodness for things like VRBO. Yes. That have, have come to us now. You can rent a house for a month somewhere else and move in furnished, live there until you know where you're going next. It's actually a very exciting time in your life. You're, you've come to this decision for a reason and you will get to actualize that decision. And I think going back to your selecting an agent, when you do select an agent, that agent should be able to, and you have to feel comfortable that that agent has the skills to do this, to take you through, go through your house room by room, help you decide what goes away into a storage unit or into the basement or elsewhere, and what stays, and to be able to do it in a fairly quick timetable, and also tell you what needs repainting, what doesn't, what needs repair, what doesn't, and so that worker bees can get on that for you, because quite often you're trying to do this in a short period of time. If you have a longer period of time, then you can sit and purge. You can go through boxes and decide what gets donated and all those things. But if you have a relatively short period of time to decide to put the house on the market, then it needs to be a really cut and dried process. And a good realtor will help you through that. There is nothing better than the maybe pile that goes to a storage unit. Yep. Listen to your agent. They know what needs to happen. It will, you'll get what you're looking for so much more quickly. Laura, how long does it take to sell a house now? Well, <laughs> it, it, the, that really depends on is it appropriately priced, what is its condition, and if the, if the condition is good and it's appropriately priced, it's going to sell right away and maybe with multiple bids. And I'm sure listeners out there, if they've been on the buying end, may have been part of multiple bids lately. It's, it's really quite a surprise because pundits were saying that 2020 was going to be a slow year because of COVID. Well, it was anything but. And it doesn't look like 2021 is any different. We have very low inventory and very high demand. And there are buyers out there looking and waiting. So this is truly a good time to sell your house. That's very encouraging. What has changed, if anything, because of the pandemic? Oh, goodness. Well, there, the process itself has changed quite a bit because it, it, we're not doing open houses. At least I'm not doing open houses. It's not safe. And a lot more is being done virtually than being done on site. And also with quarantine rules, when people come to the state, they have to quarantine if they've been traveling. So a, a lot has changed in terms of how we're buying and selling right now. Eventually, when the vaccination is more widely used, we'll go back to more normalcy. But right now, 
buyers have to sign hold harmless agreements, as do sellers. For every showing, everyone has to be masked. It's, and we all have to be very careful. And that's a good thing. Do you think that the early days of the pandemic held property off the market? Yes. There were a number of houses that were supposed to come on the market last spring who will probably come on the market this spring or may wait even longer. Who knows? But my feeling is that the last spring houses that waited because they didn't have to sell and COVID was terrifying uh, will be coming on this spring or summer. So that's a wonderful opportunity if you're a buyer. It is. It is. It is. Katie, you've been a great guest, and we've been talking about something that's a pretty big ticket item because people's homes are often the biggest single investments in their portfolios. And the goal of everyone on, the, on your team, if you're a seller, is to maximize your value that you get at sale. And so in order to do this, readying your house for sale is all about making it the best it can be, making it the best it can be for photos, making it the best it can be for showings. And there are ways to do that and to do that expediently and to really go through each room and, and, and cull Cull the herd and put a lot of stuff elsewhere, and storage units are fantastic. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Typically, my business, Eastridge Design, steps in during the buying of the new home process. But I do want to say that in the past seven years, as taste has come to a more middle ground, one of the things that we like to do when someone has purchased a new home is think about the, the heretical moment that at some point this house will sell. So that anything that we recommend, we have our eye on the way, way, way far along future and making decisions and spending money because as Laura says this is often a family's larger asset making those decisions that will appeal to a wider array of points of view than just yours it's not to say that you can't personalize but the greater decision should be made as soon as possible and Katie you are wonderful at looking at the furnishings and possessions and artwork that people currently own that they want to take to that next house and augmenting that with the new and the fresh that fits in with whatever they're looking to create. And I've seen the results of it myself and it looks fantastic. And everybody has things they want they don't want to get rid of everything. But you're also good at being very honest and saying, you know, I know you love that couch, but that really doesn't fit in terms of starting afresh. And I, I think that, I think that your, your personality is great with clients and your design choices are fantastic. Thank you very much. I, so, as, as an individual, not in my profession, I love eclecticism. I have a very eclectic group of home possessions. That, and I have no intention of moving, if I knew that my house were going on the market, I would remove. And I'm a decorator. It looks fabulous, but it's just... It's too extreme for the wide array of tastes. So anything, and I won't say which one of these I have in my own home, anything that is religious, 
political, or racy. Probably just shouldn't be there. True. That's, so it's, it's anything controversial needs to go away. As far as your possessions, I honestly believe that if you buy very good furniture that's well-made, beautifully designed and well thought, you can keep it for the rest of your life. Maybe it needs to be reupholstered. Maybe it needs to be refreshed. Maybe it needs to be refinished. But if you love it, and it really is lovable, there's a place for it in your home. Is there a place for it in your home when your home is going on the market? Now, aha, that is a different question. And that yes, is, is where your agent is going to guide you. Yes. Yes, it is. It is. So, Katie, if people would like to get hold of you, what is the best way for them to do that? Oh, it's very simple. Call our office. Go online. My business name is Eastridge. That's like a high school, East Ridge, though it is a, <laughs> just an old English word. My husband's name originally, not mine. Um, Eastridge Design. We have a huge web presence. We try to keep our web presence refreshed, showing our newest projects. And on that website, at the end, there's an info app. Please contact us. Not That's even good. if you have a project. If you just want to talk about something, we're open. That's great. That's great. Thank you. Because I've taken advantage of you before. And I intend to again. <laughs> I'm happy to do it. I genuinely and seriously care about residential, interior, architecture, home furnishings, and homes, and how people feel about their houses. I want happiness and love at all times. And if I can just answer a few questions to help somebody understand, easily done. And feel free, anyone who's listening, uh, on the podcast website, you can ask a question of me by email very easily. And you can also send one to Katie and I can forward it to her. So uh, please feel free to, to ask questions. I love getting questions. Katie loves getting questions. And I will do my best to answer them sometimes on the next podcast. Sometimes I will just talk to you directly and answer any question that you have, and you'll always remain anonymous. Just, just know that. And, but your questions are probably questions that others have as well. So there is no question too stupid. There is no question too, uh, too crazy. Just ask away, and I'll do my best to answer that. And if you contact Katie, she will do the same. All questions are good questions. All questions are good questions. So thank you all. Thank you, Katie. Big, huge thank you. And this is the end of episode one, readying your home for sale. And we've basically just touched on things. There are so many specifics that we could dive into if we had more time. And I'm happy to do that offline with, with listeners. So Thank you so much, Katie, for, for being here and being a fantastic guest. Thank you, Laura. And, uh, and goodbye. Goodbye. Enjoy the spring market, everyone. You bet. Bye-bye now. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Princeton Real Estate Podcast with Laura Huntsman. Our podcasts are produced by HG Media and can be heard on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts.